All right, very fast intro. Welcome to, uh, well, Creator Stage is one, but uh, CPV's over that way right afterwards. Uh, but go to our second talk first over here again afterwards. Uh, but uh, welcome. And this is Professor or Rachel. Uh, we're thrilled to have her. Uh, she's a professor once again at Columbia University. And we are so excited for this talk. Uh, I got a chance to see these slides last night. You're going to walk away thinking I know everything about differential privacy. Uh, so uh, once again, here you go. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we made it. <laughs> Um, this is my first DEF CON, super excited to uh, be here, all of that. Thank you for your extreme patience as we got things um, going. As a result, I'm going to have to skip some things in my talk so that we can end on time, but I will be hanging out afterwards at the like uh, Crypto Privacy Village. And so come, come like I'm see me and say hi. I'm giving a surprise talk there at 1.30, which I think the surprise will be the slides that I skipped. So, you know, come and see that. <laughs> Uh, great. So, so my so my work is really about a differential privacy. If you haven't heard of it, you might be an expert by the end of this talk. It's okay. Have to be over here. Oh no. Okay. So the so the like a mental model you should think about as we talk about our differential privacy should be something about there's a database it's important and we want to analyze it and do like you know scientific business analytics whatever on it and there's an analyst who's going to like send some queries receive back a few answers this process is going to like um continue and so she says I've made some like a scientific uh, discovery maybe it's like you know this this drug works maybe it's here is a database that can be freely published that I have made as a function of the original database such that if you were to evaluate all my same answers, you would get back approximately the same answer on this new database. And you might want some kind of like a privacy preserving barrier at some point in this process. And so maybe it's between the database and the analyst if you don't fully like uh, trust this analyst. Maybe it's between between these sort of analysts and the outputs. If the outputs are going to be like a uh, publicly viewed, maybe you also want some, some like uh, boundaries there. And the model that I think of in my work is a mental model about, about privacy promising people freedom from harm. Nothing bad is going to happen to you because you have shared your data with this analysis process. And formally, we're going to say, or like informally, <laughs> some analysis of a data set is going to be private. If an analyst can know almost no more about Alice afterwards, then he would before or sorry if he had instead done done like the same analysis on the same data set without Alice's data and this allows us to learn things like you know smoking causes cancer but it doesn't allow us to learn things about your specific health information So the, so the like a differential privacy definition visually looks like this. Imagine if I have a database containing data coming from lots of people and I plug that into my favorite randomized algorithm that will, that will produce some, some like um, curve, which is a like um, a PDF of the outputs of this algorithm when instantiated on this particular database. And so on the x-axis, imagine like you know, all possible things and sort of like a, might be a produced by, by this algorithm. On the y-axis is going to be how likely is that output to, to occur if I input D. I'm going to move this a little bit closer. See if that helps. Good. So now we're going to, to imagine if I change one person's data, say that I change Alice into being Javier, and I plug my new database that is uh, the same except for one person's data into my same randomized algorithm, I'm going to get out a slightly different curve. And our hope in a privacy space is that like uh, the ratio between these two curves is going to be bounded pointwise along this x-axis. 
So now, why is this this privacy? I've talked about like you know freedom from harm, and now I'm talking about like you know bounding ratios as to the PDFs of algorithms. Well, imagine there was a particular output observed by some adversary who then wanted to uh, decide that I observed this output because of Alice's data or, or like uh, because of Javier's data. Well, that adversary information theoretically could not make a guess about the individual's data in the input beyond the like a small amount allowed, allowed uh, by the ratio. So now in math it says this. So an algorithm M, the maps, the maps from a like a data set of size N, that is like a data, data coming from N people, into some arbitrary output range R, is going to be parameterized epsilon differentially private if it is the case that uh, for all neighboring databases D and D prime that are the same except for one person's data, and for all possible things I may produce as a result of the analysis, for all sets R, S, I'm going to produce something in that set S with about the same probability under D and, and like a D prime. And so we're saying if I change one person's data, I'm going to output the same thing with about the same probability. And so notice that our epsilon parameter occurs in the exponent, which is probably not how you think about privacy, which makes it harder to explain to people without a like a technical background. I'm like imagining somebody's grandmother might like you know, have a hard, hard time with this unless you have a like an extremely, extremely like a mathematical grandmother. Maybe. Um, 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 and we're going to get back to that point in, in the talk. That's going to be sort of a core point. Before we um, get there, why do we care about this uh, particular privacy notion? One thing is that it's used kind of, kind of ubiquitously. Um, no one talks about it as much because it isn't a super sexy privacy notion as we talk about like, you know, bounding ratios and exponents, but it's used um, by like a virtually every like a big tech company and now sort of like a growing use in and like I'm um, government. So now let's return to to the like a core of my talk, which is which is the field of like a differential privacy has paid a whole lot of attention into like algorithms, guarantees, mathematics, theorems, proofs, publishing academic papers, which is wonderful, and that's my entire background. But there has been very little attention paid to these really core concepts of things like policies, regulation, government, practice, how do organizations make uh, decisions about these uh, tools, communication, how to tell people how they work, why they work, and the nature of the um, guarantees. So in particular, there is no step-by-step -step guide for a new organization who may be like, you know, here's my talk and it's like, wow, wow, that's amazing. I want those tools for my data. There's, there's no handbook for it. And in particular, a couple, four things that are missing is there's no guidance in terms of how do you pick epsilon? It seems really important. How do you pick it? How do you communicate guarantees about this, um, about these sort of like a nature and strength of the privacy guarantees to the stakeholders? How do you understand privacy accuracy trade-off? Inherently, if you are doing something that gives stronger differential privacy, you're going to take a little bit of an accuracy loss. How do you how do you understand that? And then finally, how do you align technical privacy guarantees with the like of policies and laws? And is that and this is also a sort of like an outline of my talk. Realistically, I'm going to skip four so that they don't get mad at me. Um, <laughs> um, but let's uh, talk first about about one. So. So this is sort of like, you know, at the crux of a sort of everyone's implementation questions. I always get asked, what's a right epsilon? And the truth is there is no single right answer. There's no easy answer. So this epsilon parameter quantifies information leakage. How much can, 
can be learned in a like slightly convoluted uh, definitional way about individuals and the epsilon can be tuned to be any value between zero and infinity. So, so like, you know, how, how much privacy leakage is acceptable? Um, um, oops. And there's no easy answer in part because there are no best practices for it. It's kind of a wild, wild west. Everybody just like picks something that, that works. They also don't, don't really tell people what they do most of, of the time. There's a lot of like, you know, closed door meetings about the right epsilon, but it's very infrequently published. Additionally, this is sort of getting at the privacy accuracy trade-off they'll talk about more. And of course, like uh, different applications are gonna have, have like a different privacy needs and different accuracy needs. And so they're like, quote unquote, right epsilon should depend on the use case, on the specifics, on the needs, on the organization. And it might look like a very different in the federal government versus in a startup versus, versus in a large tech company. It might look different if we're talking about advertising versus, versus healthcare. It makes sense that it should be um, different. So in fact, one thing that the field has, has like um, proposed but is not quite done yet is the notion of an epsilon registry. And this is an idea that will sort of like um, increase a transparency around uh, privacy parameters so the organizations can really share, 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 not just what is their epsilon, but also sort of like all the other features that are important in terms of why, why that was their right uh, choice. One more reason why it's hard is because it's hard to articulate what this epsilon means. No one like you know, has an intuitive, uh, yes, 1.2 feels right in my soul. <laughs> but instead, it's really hard to, to explain. It's a unitless parameter. It is contextless, but as we talked about, like a context is important. It's like, you know, very mathematical. It involves a, like, you know, logarithm on the worst case bound of the, of the, like, you know, probabilities of a randomized algorithm. It's hard to, like, you know, gain intuition about what is right there. And it's sort of like it doesn't match what we think about when we think about privacy. So you can sort of imagine there's a picture and it looks like this and it's like, you know, stronger privacy guarantees versus weaker privacy guarantees. And like an important detail is that like a, the way in which in which like a differential privacy is achieved algorithmically is by sort of sort of like adding noise to the process and you add noise in a carefully calibrated way and there's a lot of work thinking about how much noise what type of noise and like where in, in your process but you sort of like I'm always add a little bit of randomization in there and so the question is really about how much noise um, this is a question that I have worked on but I think I'm gonna skip it so they don't get mad at me again I'm sorry that we started late um, I'm very happy to like you know share share things um, about this but I'll say that a sort of like you know main me like I'm finding of this work is that if you give people math-based explanations in terms of the like a likelihood of what will happen under various choices accompanied by some like a visualization of those choices it increases objective comprehension and it also increases feelings of self-efficacy in terms of like you know, having enough information to make choices and again this sort of right answer isn't global but it is like you know what is the right choice for your for you for your application and so feeling as though you like you know, have enough information is important. Um, let's go to number uh, two talking about like you know communicating guarantees to the other stakeholders. So the previous sort of like you know, explanation of epsilon was really just about the epsilon to people who are going to share data in some like you know, algorithmic process. But there's lots of other important people in this process. So we have, so we have data subjects who are the ones who have to like share, share data and like I decide if it's a good, good idea. 
We also have Helicom engineers who have to make uh, decisions and they have to like you know, implement code and they have to think about like, you know, parameter tracking, downstream implications of privacy and so on. We have Harlequin data curators who are the ones with the power to either share or to not share data sets with like, you know, various analysts and they have to like uh, decide when is the right time to share or to not share under what conditions, under what agreements. We have data analysts who really don't care about the privacy part at all. They just care about analyzing data and about maintaining exactly the same pipeline they were doing before. And so if you're like a difference of pri private pipeline looks completely different and you like can't use Python, people will be mad at you. <laughs> and so it's important you also incorporate privacy, pri privacy tools in a way that is not, not so like a disruptive in that. Um, there's also like a privacy officers who have to think about uh, things like things like a compliance in the organization, regulatory requirements. <laughs> Executives have to make a decision. Is this good for my company? What is the cost if I have to like you know, hire a bunch of privacy engineers? How much is that? going to cost. If you talk to me about like you know, accuracy loss, I don't want accuracy loss. <laughs> um, there are lawyers who have to like uh, decide, is the use of this technology compliant with the privacy laws and the regulations around the, um, the um, use of data? And there's also like a policy makers who get to make new laws around the use of data if we think our current ones are like not particularly particularly <laughs> adequate. And so for sort of all of these entities, they have to make different types of uh, decisions. They have to, and they also have like a different amounts of sort of like a background expertise and, and like, you know, realistically attention span. <laughs> And so you want to tailor, tailor like um, communication strategies to these individuals in no way, in a way that sort of really like uh, meets, meets their, their, their needs. I have more to say about a lot of these, but again, we're going to skip to the next topic and like uh, talk to me afterwards if you want to hear more. Good. Um, so. So for topic three, understanding this sort of a privacy accuracy trade-off is really important because of course nobody likes to lose privacy, but also nobody likes to lose accuracy. So we had this like a picture before, and this is really the way it is like I described in academia is we say on the left, there's like good privacy and bad accuracy, and on the right, there is bad privacy and good accuracy and like, you know, pick a spot in the middle and, and like, you know, you can pick where in the middle you feel like being, but that's sort of what you get. But I think this is not really capturing what is happening. Instead, I think the picture looks a little more like this, how there's some like, you know, privacy accuracy curves. And of course you can't get like you know, amazing privacy, amazing accuracy at the same, same time. And so that's infeasible. In the bottom left, you get bad accuracy and bad privacy and you can for sure do that, but it's not particularly helpful. And then you have these like, you know, spaces in between, maybe there's some like, you know, feasibility curve or some like, you know, Pareto frontier of the trade-off based on current like a technology. And like, you know, a lot of the work on the algorithmic side is sort of like, you know, pushing this curve further out so that we can, we can get like, you know, better privacy and better accuracy simultaneously. But like at a current moment in time, we have some, 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 some curve and the company can, can like pick, I feel like being there on this curve. One important question, this is a cartoon. How do we quantify privacy? How do we quantify accuracy? What do these things actually really mean? so that we can like actually truly plot them. And the truth is we're not super good at doing either of them. So, so we'll start with the privacy challenge, which is 
which is it like, yes, on the privacy axis, we can plot epsilon, but as I already mentioned, epsilon is probably not what your company's executive thinks about as being important, but rather they probably think about like, you know, privacy risk, privacy threats. How will this privacy tool protect my data against various attacks, threats, and so on. But, but you sort of like us, sort of, sort of like um, standard version of doing like a risk assessment under DP, it doesn't quite match what people think about. So this is typically like a worst case. So we're thinking of an adversary that has complete knowledge of the data set and they're trying to guess Alice's data. Again, that's probably not the type of adversaries that you're facing. Can you do better against a, a more like no realistic adversary? Additionally, like a differential privacy provides like a relative guarantees. So it doesn't say, say things like, you know, there's a maximum 1% chance, but they say there's a maximum 1% multiplicative increase relative to the chance of an attack without this person's data. Again, that's probably not, not what your like an organization's uh, security team is really thinking about. And then finally, finally, like a differential privacy is really focused at the individual level. And it's really thinking about like, you know, I have to protect individual data. Population level inferences are great. That's the goal. And therefore they are not considered a, like a privacy violation. However, maybe your company's database of its customers reveals something about it's like, you know, marketing strategy or it's like um, tar 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 target audience or some other like, you know, pr proprietary information you don't want to be shared that is like a population level in the database rather than protecting one single individual. So again, so again, all these properties come out very naturally from the like a differential privacy definition, but it's probably not what is important at the organizational level. So an important challenge includes like a developing risk frameworks that match like, you know, realistic attacks. What are you actually worried about? And then sort of understanding how does, how does like a protection against those attacks match or not match like a differential privacy and vice versa. I've done a little bit of work thinking about like a taxonomy of attacks there. So I'm happy to, to sort of like chat about afterwards. And so now on the accuracy side, I will say in general, organizations are really good at sort of like you know, understanding how to like uh, track and evaluate their important metrics. Things like revenue, things like, things like, you know, customer engagement, things like market share. Organizations are really, really good at this. Um, however, that doesn't match, match the sort of like, you know, accuracy guarantees coming naturally out of the like a differential privacy literature, which are things like, you know, high probability accuracy, <laughs> additive accuracy bounds, bounds on some like, you know, on some like a particular st statistic that is um, com computed. How do you map that into revenue? <laughs> Um, I imagine there's a lot of like, you know, consultants in the world who will happily do that. But I think also this is a chance to like, you know, think a little bit more about the impact of the privacy guarantees onto the like um, operational functioning and things like, you know, if the width of my like, you know, 95% confidence <laughs> interval of a value shrinks by half, how does that impact revenue? Uh, and like, you know, those are the important types of um, questions. So again, there's a couple like, you know, research challenges here. One of them is a better understanding of the pipeline of sort of like how to map like a differential privacy guarantees into these needs. But importantly, maybe we can pitch it better, especially like, you know, to these executives Rather than saying, you're going to lose accuracy, maybe we can say using a differential privacy is going to like, you know, increase like, you know, customer trust and they're going to share data and they're going to opt in more and you'll get like, you know, better data, better PR and so on. So my fourth um, topic is about laws. I was told I'm uh, done, but I will just say, 
say, say there's like a hu huge gap between the like a privacy, privacy sort of like a mathematical guides and the, and the like a legal framework. And so I think there's a lot of interesting work t t to be done there. So I will like, you know, flash my slides of the question, when is like, you know, differential privacy compliant with like a various laws and some reasons why it's hard. And I will thank you for your time and your attention. Um, come see me at the like a crypto privacy village immediately after this if you want to add chat or my like a surprise talk at 1.30 also in the like a crypto privacy village where I will talk more about like, you know, about like a privacy laws and privacy tools. So thank you.